All right. Um, hey, everyone. I'm Stefan Greber. I'm the project leader for LexD at Canonical. Um, you might usually associate LexD with um, containers. That's no longer quite the case, so we'll go through some of that and see how things line up now. Um, first, we'll start with you know, what we are kind of best at, really, um, which is containers and system containers specifically. Um, system containers, you've got a shared kernel. They are containers. They're the oldest type of container. That's what you might associate with, like, BSD jails or zones, um, OpenGZ, and these days, LXC and NXD. They behave like a standalone system in much the same way as virtual machines do. Uh, they have low overhead, and there's no virtualization overhead or any of that stuff going on. And they're pretty easy to manage. It's just a bunch of processes on the same camel. So that's what we're mostly known for, what we've been doing for a long time. Now, on the other side, um, if you look at virtual machines, you've got a bit more separation going on. So virtual machines, virtual hardware, uh, to some extent, and virtual firmware, or virtual firmware. It is hardware. It effectively requires hardware acceleration to be meaningful. Um, you can run it completely software, but performance kind of sucks at that point. Um, the main benefit, obviously, is you can run just about anything. There is no constraint on it being Linux of the right version and everything like containers do. For in case anyone didn't know what a VM was. Um, now, for as for LexD itself, um, it's a modern system container manager and VM manager now. Um, it is written in Go. It relies on uh, for, on the container path, uses libLXC to talk to the kernel and drive containers. On the VM side, we're using QEMU to run virtual machines. It exposes a REST API to our clients. Um, the REST API has been designed to be quite simple with multiple bindings available. Um, and we've got already support in a number of, of tools up there, uh, Open Nebula, Ansible, our own CLI, or whatever other tools you might want to run. And it's designed so that you can run multiple LexD servers, or like either just on your laptop or on multiple machines, and um, support migration and operation across multiple systems. Either just individual systems that then exchange uh, containers and VMs, or and images, or as a unified cluster that will also go through in a tiny bit. Now, for where you might have seen LexD, um, LexD is used on Chromebooks. So when you install Linux on a Chromebook, for example, it effectively runs a LexD host that then runs a Debian-based container with a lot of uh, fancy pass-through features in place there to get you uh, GPU, USB, whatever access, all that stuff going on. Um, they also have nice integration to do snapshots and backups and file transfers straight into the Chrome interface. Another place you might have seen LexD other than your own systems is in Travis CI. So if you run Travis and you run um, jobs that are uh, non-x86, so if you run ARM64, if you run PowerPC, or if you run an IBM uh, S390, those workloads on Travis are running inside LexD containers right now. OK, uh, back to what LexD is. So LexD is designed to be very simple to use. Uh, it's got a clean command line interface, simple REST API, and pretty clear terminology. Um, it's, in many ways, it acts like a small local cloud on your system, um, originally only with containers. Now we've got multiple options there. Um, it is fast, so it's image-based. We support multiple storage drivers uh, with whatever copy and write feature they might have. We also support those features for um, network migration and we support um, direct access to, to hardware whenever possible. Um, we usually aim to be safe by default. Um, so for containers, that means using all the kind of security features, all the namespaces, uh, LSM, second um, capabilities, etc. cetera. Um, for virtual machines, we do intend to use more of that. We've not actually done Apamo and, Ap and, and SecComp around QMU yet. It's coming very soon. Right now, we do privilege dropping and true root, and then the VM itself uh, uses secure boot uh, in the VM. Um, and it's pretty scalable. You can go from like a single install on your laptop to clusters of hundreds of nodes running tens of thousands of containers, uh, and these days, mixed virtual machines. Um, as far as what we can run, so that's the picture for containers right now. We do generate about 300 daily images of different distros and, re and um, releases on six different architectures daily. 
Um, for VMs, we will get there. We will. Um, we are working on our tooling right now, so that it, as it builds uh, the container root file system, it then has a follow-up step of taking that file system, installing kernel bootloader, and spitting that out as a VM image. So we end up having the exact same um, content as far as the operating system for containers and virtual machines. Um, that's coming up soon. Right now, the only image that works out of the box is Ubuntu, um, because we already had ready cloud images available in the right format and everything. Um, on the clustering side, so that's an interesting aspect of LexD. Uh, we, we've got an extremely easy way to cluster multiple systems together. We don't have any external dependencies. Uh, it's using uh, DQLite as a cluster database. There was a talk in the main track about an hour and a half ago on, on that database. That's what we use for LexD clustering. Um, the API, when you talk to a cluster, is the same as the one you would talk to you just a single node LexD on your laptop. Um, if you can actually take a command line or script or whatever that doesn't know what a cluster is, and you run it against a cluster, and it will just work. The cluster will just can do some amount of balancing for you and try to make its best guess as to where to put things. If you are cluster aware, you can obviously do a lot more and like pick exactly what machine you want and get hardware details and stuff on the different cluster nodes. Um, but you don't have to, and just like a superset of the API, effectively. Um, it can scale uh, to you know thousands of containers and dozens of nodes. We actually have gone all the way to 100 nodes and like tens of thousands of containers now. It, that works fine. Uh, density for virtual machines obviously goes down because you can't quite run tens thousands tens well multiple thousands of full um, OS virtual machines on one system. It gets a bit tricky. Um, but that's not really a LexD problem so much as how much your hardware can actually achieve. Um, and we've got support for multiple architectures and mixing multiple architectures within the same cluster. Then NextD does the right thing based on what image you're using. It picks what node is actually capable of running uh, that workload. Now, for the VM side itself. So, um, as I mentioned briefly, um, yeah, we just, like, we've gone pretty much legacy free because it's new to us. We don't, we don't really need to start supporting old machine types to run DOS or Windows 95 or something. It's not something we really care about. We care about running, acting like a modern local cloud effectively. And so only really care about modern distros, which means that we've, like, for both x86 and ARM, we've gone with UEFI as the only firmware we have. It's got secure boot that you can turn off if you don't have a workload that's, that can boot with secure boot. Uh, we do Vertio devices only. Um, and currently, we're based on QMU 4.2. Technically, you can go to lower QMUs, but that's what we test with, really. Um, API and everything is, is pretty much the same as containers. So, so far, all the tools we've seen that were interacting with containers can interact with VMs, and they don't really notice a difference. Um, so there's no particular VM knowledge needed for anything that's like any tooling that targets LexD can target LexD VMs, and it will just work the same way, effectively. Um, the VMs integrate seamlessly with uh, existing LexD configuration you might have. So your LexD networks, your LexD storage pools, your LexD projects, LexD profiles and configuration. Um, those are effectively shared between VM and containers on the same system. You don't need to duplicate anything, which is really the main benefit for, for using LexD to manage your VMs. If you had two different solutions on one system, it gets a bit annoying to, man to manage. Um, but now you can just use one thing and it does it all. Um, LexD VM support was introduced in LexD 319, which was released mid-January, um, so it's pretty new. We've been working on it for maybe the past six months or so, on and off. Um, ironically, supporting VMs, very easy as far as we're concerned. Like the actual work to drive QEMU instead of LXC uh, and running virtual machines probably took us just a few days. Uh, the main issue we had was actually refactoring our storage layer so that we can store blocks or file systems and handle that properly. That's what took us way longer than the VM piece ever took. Um, review of the LexD API and kind of how things are structured. Um, so instances is obviously what most people care about. That's either containers or virtual machines. So it's different instance type that indicates which one of the two it is. Um, you can snapshot or back them up. Um, they're created from images. Images can have nice names, so you don't need to give them like a SHA-256 or whatever. Um, 
it can be clustered. So we've got the cluster level uh, part of the API that lists all the nodes and how things behave. Um, on the, you can also manage networks that creates bridges that you can then contact, um, connect to instances um, to um, storage pools. And that's pretty obvious what they're used for, but uh, you can create multiple storage pools on different storage drivers, different block devices, and then assign containers or VMs to that. Uh, you can create custom volumes as well and then, then attach to your instances. And those custom volumes can also be snapshotted. Um, then we've got some amount of internal components that are mostly for authentication and tracking of what's going on. Um, and some APIs against the, um, the instance itself, so for things like file transfer, executing a command inside it, attaching to the console, or publishing it as an image. All right, now for the interesting part. Let's see how that stuff actually works. Um, okay, so um, what I'll be doing is I've got, hoping the network works, it does. I've got two systems, uh, so we'll just do an initial install. So they've never really done any LexD thing before. LexD is installed, but never been configured. Uh, Mm? Uh, yeah, I can try to do that. Uh, yeah, it's probably about as, as big as it's going to get without it cutting everything afterwards. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Um, so you can see, because I've got two systems, I might as well create a cluster. It's so easy. Why not? Uh, so we'll just create one. I just need to enter it some IP, uh, yeah, just this one. Um, we're not joining an existing cluster. We're creating one, which is a password. Uh, yeah, storage would be nice. You can let it pick whatever it wants. ZFS is what it prefers on this one. Uh, default size is okay, and the rest should be mostly fine all out of the box. There we go. And that failed because... Well, because it's a demo, yeah. And also it's cutting on my screen, which is not super convenient. Uh, yeah, okay, that's like, annoying. What's the actual error? Oh, there we go. Can it sound request? Oh, did I just, did the server actually change IP? Because that'd be annoying. No, it didn't. OK. Let's try that again. I probably just typoed the IP address at that. Oh, was it? Hold on. It, yeah, it is 46. So they actually swapped IPs between the two. That's nice. Uh, because I redeployed the servers and yeah. OK. So not joining this cluster, want to set it up. I just hope it didn't get too far in setup because otherwise it might get a bit confused now. Let's see. Please don't be confused, please don't be confused. Woohoo, okay. All right, so I just need to update my notes because those IPs are not the way I was expecting them. Uh, okay, so let's go on to the second one now. And hopefully this one is 47, it is, sweet. Okay, so they literally just swapped IPs. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, yes, we're joining an existing one this time, which is on 1646. Yes. The password. There's nothing to wipe, but sure. And okay. And yay, we've got a cluster working. Um, so now, if I do cluster list. We'll see we've got two systems joined in there. The first one is running the database. Um, because you need quorum for the database, and you can't have quorum when you have only two systems. Only one runs the database. Once you reach three, then all three run the database. Um, so first thing we'll do is we're just going to edit the default uh, config for instances to add some a bit of cloud init magic in there. That's normally not needed if you only run containers. Um, also, that. The text editor is messed up, hold on. Okay. Okay. Um, but because we're running virtual machines and they don't really have any other way to get their config, um, that effectively just sets the Ubuntu password to Ubuntu through cloud in it. So just put that in place in that profile. Then let's create a container real quick. So just pulling a CentOS 8 image. There we go. Right. So 
There we go, we've got CentOS 8 running in a container. And now to show the difference with running a VM, we effectively still tell it what we want and just do dash dash VM. So it's going to go do the same thing. Um, so because we're running, I'm going to do things in parallel because we're running a bit out of time. Uh, so as far as other things we can do. So. Uh, security, secure boot, false because Windows limit CPU. So we're gonna, I'm sp that's on my own laptop. I'm just spawning another VM based on the Windows image I created. But with four CPUs, eight gigs of RAM, and my turning off secure boot because otherwise the WH, I don't have a WHQL driver for the disk, so it's not happy and doesn't boot. Uh, anyway, um, back to the cluster, just waiting for that VM to start. It's unpacking the image. Obviously, a VM image is quite a bit larger than just a container image. It takes slightly longer. There we go. Um, we need to add a config drive right now, which gives it access to the Cloudinate config. So that's the, we just add a disk device for that. And then we can start the VM. Just takes a tiny bit. Come on. That's running on really old hardware. It's like 10 years old servers that I've got laying around the basement, so it's a bit slow. So touch to the console. So we see grub. That's booting. And get to a login prompt eventually. I didn't give it any extra CPU or memory, so it's running with one core and one gig of RAM right now, so it might have been a bit more generous to probably have with it faster. Okay, Cloudinate is running, which means we're about to get a login prompt. Come on. You can do it. You can do it. There we go. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. I think I probably raised something with Cloudinate. Anyway, like the login prompt works fine. Um, so now for the, so right now if we look outside, uh, oh, no. there we go. Uh, outside of this, um, we'll see the VM is running, we've got its IP that's been retrieved from the DHCP server, uh, that's fine. But if we try and look at more info on the VM, it doesn't have the list of processes or any of the extra detail because it's a VM and it can't just attach to it like a container would. Um, but that's where we can do things a bit different. So we've got a 9P drive that's exposed by LexD out of the box uh, with an install script that just adds some systemd units, um, which if we then reboot the VM, uh, it will start back up starting those units that will run a VM agent that then talks back to us. Um, while that's ha going on, I can just show that local VM I started. Um, so Windows 10 started with an IP. Uh, because Windows in, is weird and it can do SSH these days. Um, you can actually SSH into it. <laughs> you, if you prefer PowerShell, you can also spawn it from there. Uh, if I can type PowerShell properly. There we go. So that's the thing. I can't remember which is which. So it's PowerShell exit and the other one is quit. No. Exit and exit, okay. Um, or obviously, uh, X3 RDP. Uh. So. <laughs> so that's Windows. Uh, now back to the Linux world. So that VM should have rebooted. Yep, got a login prompt. Uh, now, if we look at the list, we should still see the same thing. Um, let's see if that works. Yep. So with that, I just spawned a shell inside the VM. Um, that's done through our agent in the VM. So if we look at the process list, we actually see Bash being a child of Lex the agent. Um, that's going through VSOC. So even if you're, um, if you look at the network, yes, it's up. But if we fix that. Like we still have the shell, everything still works. The same API can be used to do file modifications. So you can pull a file through, through it, it comes from the agent, and just push back into the VM. If we get the shell back inside it, it's there. 
Um, that also gives us more details. So if you do info now, it gives you um, number of processes, it gets you IP addresses for all the interfaces, counters, and stats and stuff. All right. Need to kind of rush now because I'm a bit behind. Um, so what's next? Um, we want images on all distros. That's obviously not like priority. We want to be able to live update a bunch of devices and configs on the VM like we do for containers. Right now, you need to restart the VM. Um, more security, I mentioned AppArmor, SecComp. We want to put those. We've got all that generation code already for containers. We just need to wrap the VMs with it. Um, number of feature gaps we've got around. Uh, we've got compared to containers, we want to, to fill quickly. And the agent right now only works on Linux. We want to make it work on Windows, um, given that there's a new uh, Vertio VSOC driver for Windows that's been in the works. We hope to use that. Um, LexD itself is available on Linux, Mac, and Windows, but the daemon only runs on, on Linux. Uh, but the other ones, you can use the clients to connect to a remote LexD. Um, contributing to LexD, it's written in Go. It's, got, it's fully translatable. It's got API libraries in a number of languages. It's Apache 2 license. There's no CLA or anything. And we've got a pretty active community that can help you with issues. And that's it. Uh, I've got a bunch of stickers here if you want to grab some after, after this. And we might even have... Uh, Three minutes for questions? OK. Uh, at the start, you showed LXD as both across multiple and in individual uh, nodes. Is yes. The same API in both cases? Yep. So, uh, yeah. Uh, right, sorry. Um, so the question was about uh, the API when talking to a single node or talking to multiple nodes. Uh, yes, it is the same API. Um, the, there's like an extra field in some of the objects that just tells you where they are. Um, so there's, in the structs you get from the API, there's going to be like an extra field telling you location to know where something is. But if you don't know about that, you can just ignore it, and that just still works. Uh, OK, that's going to be hard. Uh, I think you had your hand up already. Yes. OK, so the question is whether there's any plan to integrate some of this in MAS. The answer is yes. Uh, MAS has KVM pods right now. Uh, that is being replaced by driving LexD. That was one of the drivers for this work. So the idea is to move away from MAS talking to Libvirt and moving to MAS talking to LexD. Uh, let's go there. Okay, so the question is whether we plan to backport the VM to stable channel. Um, the answer is no, because we've got, so we've got 19, 320 are thingly stable releases with that support. Uh, the snap itself is available all the way back to Ubuntu, say, 14.04, or even or CentOS 7, or quite old distros. So we test on that, and that should work fine. Uh, we've got an LTS release, LexD 4.0, that's, that's going to be coming up within the next two months. That's going to have VM support. So for those who want the five years LTS guarantees on LexD, uh, 4.0 is what you're going to want for that. Uh, let's go here. What is the MIMS type that you use in order to store the image uh, virtual machine? Sorry? What was the image type that you used? Oh, to spawn which one? Win oh, so yeah, so for the virtual machine, um, the name ends up, the solution is like, what's the image type that was used to, to spawn a virtual machine? Um, on the, so for a lot of our images, for like the Ubuntu images, there's gonna, the exact same name are going to line up for both containers and VMs, because you've got an Ubuntu 18.04 for both. Um, and that's why we've got the dash dash VM flag. That's just to tell like the, hey, I actually want the VM version of that image. And then that's what it uses. Right now, it pulls that image from the Ubuntu cloud images. Um, Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So the like the uh, solution is the actual image format uh, in the images. Okay. So the the image format we use for LexD VM images is QCA2. Um, so it's QCA2 with the LexD uh, dar exe uh, metadata on the side for just properties and stuff. But the the actual image format we support right now is QCA2. Uh, we'd probably add support for RAW because that's easy. Um, but yeah, QCA2 is what we use. Uh, we're out of time, so if you've got any more questions, uh, you can grab me outside. Uh, otherwise, stickers in front there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>